Hello, and welcome back to Break Your Budget, the podcast. My name is Michaela, and I am your host. And I am joined today by my very first guest, Austin Hankwitz. He is a, we'll call him a businessman. Um, Originally a TikTok personality. Now I think he's got a lot more going on. So I'll toss it over to you. Um, Austin, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Hey, everyone. My name is Austin Hankwitz. I'm a 25-year-old living in Nashville, Tennessee, with a really weird passion for telling stories around personal finance and investing. Um, I guess that kind of stemmed from Dave Ramsey coming to my high school to talk about Roth Roth IRA investing and how cool it is to be in the stock market. And 16-year-old me was like, whoa, I want to learn more about this. And so I got a degree in finance and economics from the University of Tennessee. I went to go do mergers and acquisitions for a couple of years out of college um, in the the, the professional corporate setting. And uh, during COVID, actually, I I picked up my cell phone and started filming some TikToks talking about how the market's crashing, you know, what what I'm doing with my money as a, at the time, 23-year-old, I think, um, and sort of how I was approaching just sort of building wealth throughout a lot of uncertainty, a lot of time of uncertainty. And that really resonated with a lot of people uh, online. And, And since then, I've been able to build a lot of uh, interesting communities, both on TikTok and Substack and Patreon a while ago. And a lot of cool things uh, have happened since then. Um, But yeah, thank you so much, Michaela, for having me on your podcast. This is an honor. Yeah. Yeah. You've got a lot going on, um, but we're going to dive into that. You said a couple of things that I'm really excited to prod on for myself personally, but also because I think everybody's going to be curious. But so as a little precursor, so Austin, you're going to be the first person to do this. But on my guest episodes, I'm going to follow a little structure and we're going to start with a hot take. So we have three hot take questions and I want to know your thoughts. So the first hot take is that content creation in the creator economy is oversaturated. I would say no, it is not because there are so many people out there who are always looking for different perspectives and different types of ways that people uh, are living their lives as it relates to how they're living their own lives. And there's unlimited amounts of perspectives out there. And I think as as more people tell their own stories, if it's, I mean, cooking and, and posting on TikTok or perhaps sharing your daily life as a college student on YouTube, or maybe being a retired uh, fella who loves fishing and is picking up a fishing pole four days a week and is live streaming it to Twitch. I feel like there's so many cool things, so many ways for people to share their lives and, and make a positive impact on other people. Um, no, not not oversaturated. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think that that's one of the biggest barriers for people to enter like the creator space is they think there's no room. But what they forget is that even if you're talking about something similar to what a bunch of other people are talking about, you still have your own unique perspective and experience. 100%. And that's what resonates with people. Um, okay, my second hot take for you. It's too late to get onto TikTok. It is, it is not it is not too late to uh, to get on a TikTok. I am launching a new uh, TikTok account. I can kind of get into this if you guys want to talk more about it. Um, I just made the account today. I'll be running it. I'll be making all the videos and I'm not doing that. I wouldn't be doing that if I thought it was too late to get on a TikTok to build an audience on TikTok, right? For example, a really, really good example of this, Axel Weber. This guy is this, you know, this this, this new kid who's, who's moved to New York City. Oh, in, like, the smallest I know ever, who that is. Right? He just got on TikTok two months ago. Guy's got millions of followers. Samsung partnership. He's a model now, like all from TikTok over since, you know, the new year, right? Or maybe call it Q4 of last year. I mean, it is not too late to be on TikTok. No way. Yeah. I feel like I saw him blow up because he lives in this, like, like a room. Um, it, it, it's like a little crazy. closet. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, hilarious. It's crazy. No, I'm doing the same thing. I'm starting a new TikTok account from scratch and we're going to see how it goes. So I definitely agree with you on that one. I don't think it's too late. Um, okay. My last hot take this one. I'm curious. What do you think is better long form or short form content? And I'll let you decide what better means to you. Okay, so I think at the end of the day, this is obviously up to whatever the creator's motive is, right? Some creators 
are really, really good storytellers and they want to sit down and tell you a six to 12 minute story on how they're building the largest Nerf cannon. But Mark Rober, right? This guy has incredible YouTube videos where he walks through how he's over engineered these glitter bombs or like, you know, he's, he's, he's incredible. So I think it really depends on, on the creator and how they're able to tell their story in the most comfortable way possible. For me though, what's better for me is the short form. I, I really enjoy having a 30 to maybe minute and a half video, 30 second to minute and a half video, um, talking about some a hot take I have on, on what's going on. For example, Lululemon, I, I know this is gonna come out in a little bit, but Lululemon just came out today on International Women's Day with um, their own sneakers. They, ha they have a, 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 a foot, uh, what is that, foot apparel? No, just sneakers, right? They have their own running shoe type vibe. Um, was announced today. There's four different types of, of shoes. Uh, so I gave him a hot take. I said, hey, this is really cool. I can make all the money from leggings. Maybe I'll do something with that. Like, I don't know. But I think that to me is is better for, for the type of creator that I am because I've got little hot takes. I'm, I'm maybe not the type to sit down and tell you a 12-minute a long story on how I've built wealth as a 25 year old or how I got my job out of college or how I, I whatever. Right. But, but for me, what I think is better is, is short form. I think people's attention span is also um, very short. And uh, when they're, especially when they're, when they're discovering a new creator, I would, I would also argue though, that if you have established a community and, and I've, I've seen this myself, if you've established a community with people and, and people know that you have smart things to say or, or things that add value to their lives, they will sit down and they will listen to those 12, 15, 18 minute longer pieces of, of content. But if you're looking to grow that audience to to be discovered, I would argue that those shorter pieces of content um, are, are better. Yeah. Yeah. I actually agree with you on that. I find it so interesting because I'm sure you've seen this, but TikTok's introducing 10 minute long videos um, and this is like a controversial thing because they're saying that TikTok's coming for YouTube. I don't think that TikTok's where people are going to sit and watch a 10 minute long video. I think it serves its purpose on short form content. You can take that long form content and put it somewhere else. Um, it's funny because I've been experimenting with some longer videos and I had one of them hit, but the rest of them, people don't watch them. Um, or they can't sit through the whole thing. Even for me, like a long, like a three minute video, I struggle to sit through it on TikTok. It's a mindset thing. I'm not on there to like, I, I agree. I think, I think that's exactly right. It's a mindset thing. I go to TikTok yeah. to watch 15 to 60 second videos. Sometimes it'll be th three minutes if something crazy, right? But yeah. I'm on the platform for videos between 15 and, and 60 seconds. I go to YouTube to watch six to 12 minute videos. I go to yeah. Netflix to watch one hour long movies. I go yeah. to, you know, whatever, right? It's like everyone has these different platform expectations ingrained within their motives of going to them. And, and yeah. I think that's a massive, it's a massive hurdle for TikTok to try and move past those expectations from a audience perspective. Yeah, I completely agree on that. Um, okay, cool. I like that little segment. Um, okay, so now we're going to get into like the bulk of this episode because I feel like I don't know enough about you. And if I, at this point, don't know that much about you, then nobody does. Like, I think <laughs> that, at least nobody on the internet. I feel like in a lot of your content, you share really good educational stuff, but I want to know more about you. So, I want to dive in to your like career journey. So obviously you work for yourself. You have a pretty successful business and that wasn't always the case. You know, you started working a corporate job. So I want to hear a little bit about how you got started working in corporate. So you mentioned what you studied in college. What was the motive behind that? And then when you were looking for a job, what kind of led you to M&A? Okay. So yeah, you want to know me? I'll, I'll start at the beginning. Um, so my parents are older. My my dad, funny enough, had me, I think, when he was 50. So my okay. dad right now is 75, 76, um, which means when, when 2008 happened, the recession of 2008, he was about 63, 64. So he was going into retirement. This The market fell out. Everyone lost their jobs, and including my dad. And he had to provide for a family of, you know, there's four of us total, right? My mom, my sister, myself, um, which means he had to do anything, you know, whatever means necessary to create uh, 
money on a, on a monthly basis through a salary or whatever, right? So uh, we ended up moving across the country uh, from Kingsport, Tennessee to Denver, Colorado on a moment's notice so my dad could have a job and, and pay for things, right? Uh, wow. We sold our house. I told my friends goodbye. It was, it was terrible. It really sucked, right? I'm this, I'm this uh, seventh grader, eighth grader who was so excited to go to high school with all my friends. I had all these friends from you know growing up and like now I've got to just jump past because my, you know, because of this recession, because the stock market tanked, because my dad didn't have his you know, a, a retirement anymore. And so that to me was this massive eye-opening moment that catalyzed all of this. I asked myself, told myself, what is the stock market and why is it so powerful that it is forcing me and my family to move across the country? Why is the stock market, why is the economy, why are these things so important and so uh, powerful that it's caused myself and many others to completely disrupt how they're living their lives? And so that's when I, I really started to say, like, okay, like, let me now understand more about um, you know, what, what, what's happened in 2008 and what is the stock market and why do stocks go up and why do stocks go down? And, and I think that really opened my eyes to, uh, I was always kind of an entrepreneur growing up. Um, I'll tell you a couple of stories about that later, but, um, like, like, for example, I, 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 whenever I did live in Colorado, I was able to save up and I got a snowblower for like 80 bucks at uh, Lowe's or Home Depot, one of these places. And, and on snow days, which were seldom in Colorado, instead of going out and like sledding, I'd like, snow blow people's driveways i remember made like 150 bucks one day snow blowing everyone's driveway in my neighborhood and i was like this is so cool um right, yeah. yeah so so all of that really stemmed from the stock market crashing and, and me having to like just our our, our family's lives were disrupted right and then I t and then Dave Ramsey's over here coming to my, my my school and you know Dave Ramsey is is there's a lot to say about this, <laughs> so, so controversial Exactly. But, you know, all that aside, what I'm saying is the guy opened my eyes to what a Roth IRA is, what the, what, what yeah. investing is, what, well, what, what money is. Right. And so from that, you know, I remember I, I, I bought my first stock in, in high school. It was one of these penny stocks. It, it was one of these random Chinese companies that we all thought we were going to get rich off of. We got lost our money. How cool is that? How fun. Right. Um, yeah. But then in college, I was like, okay, I really know that I like to learn about businesses. I like to know about accounting this is fun i took my first accounting class i'm like that whoa i can i, I understand this it makes a lot of sense to me um and and so i, I same thing with uh, economics right i i took an, an uh, economics class and 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 uh, shout to ken baker and i i really uh enjoyed it and i was like this is great so i ended up uh, ma majoring in in finance and i got a degree in finance and economics um thing is though that people might understand i'm kind of even ashamed to admit this or afraid to admit it i graduated with like 2.8 2.9. I was not a smart. Uh, You're kidding. I'm not kidding. I was terrible. <laughs> oh at so that bad is at really funny. Day. Wait, yeah. that's a good lesson though. That like your GPA literally doesn't matter. No, doesn't doesn't matter. Does not matter. And yeah. I'll and I'll share that um further here, right? So well, what it did matter for me, which was really hard, was the the job seeking part. Yeah, um, that's not it, it's it's one well thing is too like. I was such a bad student that I was taking summer classes every single summer to catch back up. I mean, I was failing Wait, a class or two a year. To me. Really? I'm like flabbergasted over yeah, that. Yeah, no, I can grab my degree off the wall. I promise I have it. Like it's it's right there. Like I graduated. Um, you know, like so. So with that being said, I, I didn't have the internships, right? I didn't have this cool experience, these awesome cool things to put on a resume. So when I graduated, um, you know, I was doing any, everything and anything I could to try and get employers' attention. Um, I I ended up, like I said, graduating with like a two point eight or a two point nine. I think it was 2.79 to be honest with you um but i i was i was on indeed i was on linkedin i was on these little places to try and find how uh where i want to, and i was i was applying for anything and everything i remember one day i sat down and i applied for like 50 jobs 50 jobs just like click and then type in my info go to their website do everything i could upload my resume write a cover letter like i was doing it all and you know maybe like six or seven were like trying to figure out an interview or talk more about this experience or that or whatever. But um, no, I ended up being inc incredibly lucky. I got incredibly lucky. Uh, I went to LinkedIn uh, to, to, to look for jobs and one of the jobs I'd found, and, and mind you, I graduated college not having a job, not having any offer, didn't have any, I, I didn't yeah. have shit, right? I had a little bit of money in savings. Yeah. I was working in the mall repairing iPhones for uh, iFix and repair. I like, I oh was like, God. I was, that was me. Right. And so, um, I ended up going to LinkedIn and I, I, you know how LinkedIn has those one click applies where you yeah. can like, so, so easy I went, applied. Yeah. Easy apply, easy apply. 
So I easy applied to um, this sort of, it was the title was strategic financial analyst for Amedesis, the nation's largest home health hospice and personal care company. Like home health hospice and personal care, that sounds like a bunch of old people and like morbid, like, you know, kind of scary. Um, but look more into it. They're a publicly traded company. Their stock was on fire. Uh, they just had new management come in a couple of years ago. A lot of cool things were happening. And, and so I applied and a couple, couple hours later, uh, the recruiter called me. Shout out to Liz. Um, and she's like, hey, is this something you're still interested in? I was like, yeah, I'm super interested in this for sure. And she's like, okay, cool. Like your, your resume checks out. Like, um, do you have time for some preliminary questions right now? I was like, yeah, of course. Asked some cool questions, got through that process. Um, and then she put me in contact with the guy uh, who ended up becoming my boss, Nick, Nick Moscato. Um, and, and we had an interview and then he's like, cool, come down to Nashville. You sound like a really cool guy. And by the, you know, this was, I was in Knoxville at the time. So it was about two hours, two hours away, uh, from Nashville. So drove out there one day, I met him in person, had some more kind of, um, questions to be talked through, but it was more of like the, let's, let's make sure this guy's not an asshole type in person interview. Um, and yeah, so that, that ended up being my, my first job and, and, and that exploded. I was so fortunate to be around such amazing people, not just from like career development and, and supportive type people, but I mean, I was working almost every single day with the CEO of a $9 billion company. My boss was the senior vice president of finance. I, I went to Boston four different times with a chief innovations officer. Uh, David Coppins, and we talked about uh, doing fun stuff with Fresenius and, and joint ventures and and, and uh, strategic acquisition, acquisitions, like all these incredible things that I just, I totally loved, I, I understood, I just never had anyone um, give me the chance to show that I, I could do those things, right? And uh, incredibly grateful for everyone at Amedesis for uh, allowing me to do that, but it was, it was a blast. Yeah, it's very interesting um, hearing your experience as a college student and how, you know, I think there's a lot of pressure on kids in college, like you're still a kid when you're in college to perform really well and that that has a direct correlation with your success in the workplace. And it's just not true at all, because I know a lot of people who have been stellar college students and really struggled with the transition into corporate America and then hearing your story, that's like kind of the opposite where you had a really great experience and you got a lot of really great opportunity and did very, very well. Um, it's just an interesting, it's an interesting perspective because I feel like it's not talked about very often. So thank you for sharing that. I'm yeah. curious too, in your job, because it sounds like you had, again, like a breadth of experience and you were, you know, working under or being mentored by these very high level executives, what in corporate America kind of helped you in your current business venture situation that you're in? And we'll get into the details of what you're doing, but I'm curious, like yep. if you were looking back on your job, what are the two or three things that you really took away from it? hundred percent. One thing, one thing helped me the most and it, it was, and I and like, it is so underrated resourcefulness. Be mm -hmm. resourceful. So for example, right? My boss would come to me, hey, Austin, we, these are our competitors. We need, like, he does investor relations too, right? So we had earnings yeah. calls. I had to figure out like this, this, and that. He's like, they just had these earnings calls. They had these things go on. Like, we're trying to anticipate what questions we might get asked or this might happen, whatever, like help us figure that out. And so like newly hired Austin Hankwitz was like, okay, cool. Like, how, what do you want me to do? Like, how, how, where do I find those things? Like what, like, what happens, right? And newly hired Austin Hankwitz was told, figure it the fuck out, man. I don't know. Just like be resourceful, right? Like that to me was the biggest takeaway ever from at least the job I had. It was like, yeah. just figure it out. I don't care how you do it. I don't care what happens, but like be resourceful. Google.com is so underrated as a website, right? Just like type stuff in mm -hmm. and learn and figure it out. And I take that now into everything I do. If it's, um, you know, trying to figure out a, a, a cool, um, post to have on Substack as it relates to cyber warfare that's happening or could potentially happen with with Russia and Ukraine, or if it's maybe a post on me trying to figure out um, a really cool take to have on on TikTok about um, someone's experience with, I don't know, right? But just, just being resourceful was a yeah. massive just takeaway that I had in, in corporate America that I, I think I'm positive I will continue to use the rest of my life. Yeah, I would say I would agree with that. And I'd say resourcefulness and being proactive, like those are the two things that 
I fully agree. At least what I've seen in my role and how to progress in your career, whether that's in a corporate setting or like what you did kind of jumping into your own business, being able to do things without needing to take direction, like doing it on your own is like the most important thing you can do to become valuable to your company, A, but also to like set yourself up if you're looking to take a leap out of corporate America or start your own business and do that whole thing. So that kind of leads me into my next question for you is your whole transition out of corporate America and into running your own business. So a couple of questions um, to start. I don't mean to interrupt, but before we jump into that, I wanted to have one last comment on what you were talking about earlier about how it's not talked about enough where people struggle, um, you know, once they graduate to, to sort of get into this new role in corporate America. I think a lot of that struggle stems from structure that we have in, in school, right? We're, we're taught yeah. for 18 years of our lives, be at this classroom at this time, here's your homework, you do this, right? This is going to be on the test. Like it's very structured and it's very predictable. Um, and I think those people, like there are people who thrive in that, in that environment. I was not one of them, obviously. I, I, I just, mm-hmm. I was, I, I, I hated having so much like structure with my day. It's like, let me just go do what I want and it'll get done. I promise. Right. Um, which is why I, I guess I, I, I thrived in, in corporate America. But I, I think that to me is, is the major sort of tipping point that I think a lot of people need to find out for themselves, right? It's like, what types of environments do you thrive in? If, if it's structured, if it's unstructured, if it's very by the book, if it's very you know resourceful, whatever, and, and make sure you put yourselves in those situations where you are thriving, whatever that environment works best for you. Um, that's, I think it comes down to like self-awareness and other things like that. But um, yeah, now, now I think about it, I think that is, that's, I don't know, I just want to add that before we jumped in, but yeah. Yeah, no. That's an amazing point. And that's another thing too that my, like I've experienced myself is I've learned the kind of environment that I feel like I perform very well in. And now I'm able to like suss out different opportunities that come across my way as this is or isn't the right fit for me because I know how I work. I know what I'm looking for. I know where I want to go. And when you take the time to like become self-aware and figure that out about yourself instead of following you know, this structure that we've been told and that we've been following for our whole lives, I think, you know, you learn a lot about how you'll be successful as a person in your career, you know, whatever that looks like for you, which for everybody, it's going to be very different. Um, Definitely. And I think you're a good example of that. I I appreciate that. No, I was going to say, now we can, now we can get into the next question. Yeah. So I think this is where it's going to get, I think a little bit more juicy. I'm curious, what was your experience? So first, basically you came onto TikTok during COVID, like a lot of other people did. And you were one of the people who I feel like pioneered almost part of this personal finance content creation niche on TikTok. I feel like you were one of the first ones. You definitely came up on my For You page early on. Um, And I'm curious of what prompted you to do that in the first place, like posting on TikTok. Where did your first TikTok come from? And what was it? Do you remember? I do remember. Um, Okay. So backpedal, it's like late 2019, right? COVID wasn't, you know, it's not a thing. Um, I'm watching Andre Jack. I'm watching Graham Stephan, Meet Kevin, these rock stars on YouTube, not just crush it from from a personal brand perspective, but makes so much money. They are making, I mean, Graham Stephan does like this. This is how much I made this year video, right? And I'm like, this guy made $400,000 on YouTube. What the fuck? Like, this is so cool. Like, let me do that. So I, um, you know, I went out and and I, I was like, all right, let me go make a YouTube channel. I want to do this. I want to be one of these personal finance um, personalities. A lot more similar to Nate O'Brien. I don't know if you know who that is, but he's a rock star, but he is a less, he's very practical, right? And I wanted to be similar to him. Um, so I, I made a video. I was thinking I, it, it, it flopped. It looked terrible. Nothing happened. Um, I didn't know how to edit it. I didn't know how to make a thumbnail. It was just so much time and energy. And I was already working, maybe call it 65 hours, 70 hours a week at a medicist. I just didn't have time. So then I thought, okay, well, if long form you know, horizontal content on YouTube isn't my thing. I still want to share. I still want to talk about this. Where can I do that in the most effective manner with a very little overhead? And so I took a page out of Gary Vee's book. I'm sure you know who Gary Vee is. Um, but he, he would always say, it doesn't matter how high production quality the content is. It matters what you're saying. It matters the impact you have on the person listening. 
And so I knew what I wanted to say. I knew that I want to talk about personal finance and investing and my experience getting to a favorable position at 22, 23 years old from a financial perspective, because I started, you know, I was, I was investing on with Betterment at 18 years old. I, I, I knew how to invest in the stock market, stuff like that. And so um, I said, okay, well, let me uh, do what I can and let me just be resourceful picked up my iPhone eight. I still had a home button. Right. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I, I pick up my phone and I download TikTok because that's what everyone's doing at the time. And instead yeah. of dancing or maybe making uh, doing a challenge or making cookies, um, which is all great things to do, by the way, I instead pointed my phone at my computer screen, showed people that the stock market was crashing explained to people that the last time the stock market crashed like that was in 2008, which had presented a incredible buying opportunity for baby boomers, um, which at the time were, you know, call it, they were probably in their, I want to say late forties, early fifties, right. Heading into retirement yeah. pretty soon, but not too soon, but a great buying opportunity for these people to build wealth. Um, you know, I, I, I gave all the stats for what, how long recessions last. I gave the stats for, yeah. um, you know, a, a specific, it was called SPHD, which was a, uh, it's, it's the S&P 500's highest paying or highest yielding dividend stocks uh, with the lowest volatility. It's an ETF, SPHD. And so what I did is I, I, I modeled out if, if and at the time it was trading at $28, $29 a share. So I modeled out if someone bought one share of this ETF every single month, right? 30 bucks, very attainable. I, I modeled out how much that would cost over a year, three years, five years, um, what that would look like, assuming that the stock market would continue to appreciate, considering these are the S&P 500 stocks, right? So call it six to 8% a, a year. Um, and then also the dividends reinvested, stuff like that. And I showed people how easy it was to build wealth. And I showed them how easy it was to begin to have passive income, right? Through dividend investing took off like a rocket. People loved it. It got 400,000 views in the first uh, like 12 or 18 hours, a million views over the first day or two. And I had tons and tons of people just saying more, 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 more. Where can we get more? And so I, it was funny though, is like, I, I was scared. I was like, I don't want people to know I'm on TikTok. Cause at the time, like TikTok was like right. an app for people that were like that. dancing and like, you know, uh, Josh Richards, right. It's like Noah Beck, yeah. like I'm not him. I'm not trying to be him. Right. Being a creator yeah. wasn't it yet. Um, and, and to your point about pioneering all this Humphrey Yang, um, Justin O, um, gosh, what's his name? And Main Street Wolf. I forget, oh, I forget his first name. Anyway, those were the the, the logical finance as well. Um, yeah. Those was, those were some of the guys who pioneered. We all had a group chat like back in March and April of 2020, and we're all like, "What?" Oh, and and Imani explains Zaid. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, Zaid. Uh, anyway, um, those those were all rock star folks, and they still are rock stars. It's just. Um, it's just really cool to, to see how everyone's transformed. And I definitely want to give credit to where uh, credit's due. Yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with all those guys. I think that um, it's so interesting to me, and we're not going to dive too deep in this unless you want to, the difference in male finance content creators sure, and female sure. finance content creators and just like how you message things, saying the same thing, but the messaging is so different. I find it fascinating. Um, but back to your mm -hmm. point on like sharing your dividend stock that you were uh -huh. talking about, do you find that mapping out and laying out numbers is what truly resonates with people? Yes, 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 yes. A hundred thousand percent. My most viral videos are me making a clear roadmap as to how someone goes from point A to point B with their money, right? So my Why most do you think that is? Because people want to know, like people don't. I love people, right? I'm not trying to be mean to people. People don't want to do the research themselves. They want to be told what to do. This was mm -hmm. why my Patreon and my Substack are so successful, right? People want to find someone that they can trust who has done it before and they want to just do what, they, the, do what they're told, right? Just do what this person has done and, and continues to tell them what to do. Um, for example, right? My, my most viral video, it's got probably 17 or 18 million views across Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Um, but it's me showing someone, showing anyone how to retire a millionaire over a 40 year time period by investing toward the Roth IRA or within the Roth IRA, right? And so what I did is I said, step one, um, make you know taxable income, right? Because you need taxable income to invest with a Roth IRA. Uh, step two, go to betterment.com, uh, open up an account, right? Step three is uh, obtain or, or make $250 a month 
boom. Step four, put that money and transfer it to Betterment. That's all you have to do. And people are like, whoa, yeah. I have to make money. I have to open up an account and then I just transfer the money into this. Like, that's so cool. What, what's Betterment? And I didn't have a, a deal with them or any means. It was who I used at, at 18, right? Because I, yeah. You know, um, and that's what I was doing, right? And, and so I was just trying to share my experience, share what I was doing as a 23, 24 year old at the time, um, just who's, who's also trying to figure it out. And people said, this is simple. Why isn't everyone doing this? And I ended up funding. 40,000 accounts for betterment 40,000 people saw that video and started investing toward their retirement for the very first time because of a TikTok video that I made which is the coolest feeling in the world right and yeah. and not just how awesome that is for these people to start investing but betterment a company who's crushing it is doing a lot of really good things for a lot of people starting investing for the first time you know I saved them 7 million dollars in ad spend um I, yeah. I added 78 million dollars in enterprise value to the last round of funding which is incredible good for them right but it's like it just it's 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 awesome i love it and it's uh i to, to your point though i 100 percent agree people love to be shown a a map on how to go from point a to point b in a very easy step-by-step -step manner people like to be told what to do knowing that they can trust the source telling them yeah it makes it feel possible it makes it feel like the stuff that you're seeing on the internet isn't just stuff you're seeing on the internet it's stuff that you can actually do and apply to your life and it doesn't take hours and hours and hours. Because I think, too, something that you're really good at is breaking the stock market down to be less intimidating. Like, I feel like the stock market can be, if you don't know anything about it, incredibly intimidating. And it's hard to figure out where to even start. So having simple breakdowns is like life-changing. It's life-changing information for people. A hundred percent. And to back to your point about, you know, making it very simple... I think what we both do very well is we recognize that not everyone can max out the Roth IRA every year. Not mm -hmm. everyone can invest hundreds of dollars a month. Not everyone can do those things. And so I think another reason why that initial video about retiring a, mil a millionaire went so viral is I said, okay, and if you don't have $250 a month, let's plug in, let's, let's pretend you only have 50 a month or a hundred. And I still showed a model. I still showed the numbers as to what that looks like. So, yeah. and, and I even, I didn't just start at, you know, when, when I did my model with the Excel stuff, you know, you can like, add, yeah, but I didn't just start at 25 years old or 30 years old. I started at 35. What it would look like if you started at 40 years old, right? People, not everyone comes from the same starting line as it relates to when they start investing or how much they're investing, but like just being able to help them conceptualize what it looks like for them and just say like, this is attainable. You can do this. Like, let's all do this together. Like we got this, like it is a game changer. Yeah. You should remake that video. Let's see how it does. Okay, maybe I will. <laughs> um, okay, so obviously you've had a lot of success on TikTok and you made the leap from your corporate job to becoming an entrepreneur, doing your own business. You have a business partner, a co-founder. Tell me about that. Like what was, where, where did the needle turn for you to make that jump? What did you do to prepare financially and... Give me the whole the whole story. Yeah. So um, I was making $65,000 a year at Emeticis. Okay. It started at, I think, 62. It was bumped up to 65. And I was overdue uh, for another bump to like 70 or something, right? But I was yeah. making about 65000 a year. Um, I took that money. Uh, so from a take-home perspective, I think it was close to like 3800 a month, 4000 a month, something like that. Um, I have a roommate. I've always lived very below my means, right? So I ended up, I had a roommate all out of, I lived like in a terrible location in Nashville so I could save money. Uh, I had a roommate. I, it was, a, I mean, it was like, I was, I was doing everything I could to save as much as I could and also invest toward, I just, I didn't care about going to the bars. I didn't care about going out and experiencing Nashville. Like I just cared about being in the best financial position. With that being said, I think that was a major step in the right direction that assured me that I could make this leap, right? So mm -hmm. how it all started was, you know, I'm making a couple of videos on TikTok. I get a random company or here and wants to sponsor my, my stuff, hundred bucks. Like, yeah, a hundred bucks sounds good to me. Like, let's do it. Um, and then the video with, with Betterment popped off. I want to say it was like June of 2020, maybe July. Um, and they're like, Hey, let's, let's, let's continue working together and we'll pay you $3,500 a video. And I'm like, wait a second, you want to pay me? $3,500, that's how much I'm making for a whole month's worth of work at a Metasys. And I'm working my face off over there and you want for a video, like let's do it, right? And then I realized public, 
wanted to pay me for my content. And then I realized that, you know, uh, BlockFi. And then I realized that, you know, uh, Delta Investment Tracker, I think they were an early uh, sponsor. And then well, long, long story short is not only did, were these companies reaching out and saying, hey, like, you make really good content. TikTok's this next platform that we want to get on. Like, how can we work together? And then, and then, but, but so not only that, but I also had this Patreon account. And so what Patreon was, is it was the smooth extension away from my TikTok, which was video into a more written context, right? So when someone said, or when I maybe said like this, it's SPHD video, it's 45 seconds long, but on Patreon, I can write a 12 paragraph essay sort of on the holdings inside of SPHG, those, the yeah. dividend growth that those companies have had, the, uh, you know, all these other different things. I can cite my sources and I can give people all the information they need to make the best uh, decision with their money. And so I um, want to say the time I quit my job, I had like 1,200, 1,400 people uh, on my Patreon who were supporting my work every month, um, which was, there was, it was tiered from like $4 to $9. Uh, I think maybe I had a, a $17 tier too, but it was, yeah. it was tiered like that. And so like, if you do the math, it's like, okay, like this guy's making way more money doing this TikTok stuff with Patreon and these sponsored ads and all this fun stuff um, than he is with his job. And so that was really hard for me to, to make the transition because 100% honest, like I loved my job. I loved working yeah. for Metasys. I loved working for Paul and Nick. I loved working for, I mean, it was, it was a really good job and I really enjoyed it. Um, and so then I realized like, okay, I can, I, I had a long talk with my boss um, and he pretty much told me, he's like, listen, dude, not everyone has these really awesome opportunities to go pursue a passion that if done correctly, like you don't have to do this for the rest of your life. You don't have to be this. Like, like, like don't put pressure on yourself to be this for the rest of your life. But if you can do this while it's fun and hot and, and really you love it, right? Um, and, and, you know, the market's hot and you're passionate about it. You can squirrel away 300, 400, $500,000 uh, over a five-year time period doing this and then get back to work when you're 30, like I am. Well, he was 30, right? So talking to him and then get back to work and have a incredible nest egg toward your retirement. And then you just, you know, get back on like, like everything else was, so you can go be happy with that too. And so that's when he said that, I was like, you know what, you're, you're right. Um, I should just, I should roll the dice here and see what happens. And so breaking down the income streams, right? So on, on one side we had Patreon, uh, I would say at its peak, that was somewhere between like 15 to $18,000 a month I was making there. Yeah. Uh, Which have, just, just to pause there is like really, 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 really great money for starting a business. Like I what? was flabbergasted. In like six it, months. Like, it is insane. unbelievable. It is. Yeah. That's insane. really crazy. Yeah. I was incredible. And the thing was like the money, in my opinion, yes, it was uh, super grateful and super just, I can't even put it into words. But to me, what was just as awesome was this isn't money from like a corporation. This wasn't money for an mm -hmm. ad. This was money from 1,400 people that fucked with me so much. They wanted to give me $9 out of their hard-earned money to yeah. sit down on a Sunday night and let me live stream with them for an hour and a half talking about the markets and my uh, investments and my crypto and like uh, I, and, and I analyze stocks in real time in front of them, right? Like, People like I, remember, I mean, I remember sitting in a live stream once with seventy people, just like asking me questions. We were, we walked through um what a stock analysis of like Square or or Twitter, like one of these cool companies, and like what I thought of their earnings and like what to be looking out for, and like like just I I, I these are real people. That to me is also yeah. an incredible yeah. part of all that. It's like and it's that's the power of TikTok. That's mm -hmm. that's going even back to that initial hot take question I had. Like, is it too late to get onto TikTok? You don't need to have a million followers on no. TikTok to make sense. big money. You don't need it. Or, or you know, to make money on your own without any sponsorships. Like 1,400 people. That's a lot of people. But what is that in relation to the amount of people on TikTok? What are there? Like 2 billion people on TikTok? 1,400 people is, there's 1,400 people out there for everyone. 100%. Um, if yeah. you're listening right now and you haven't yet heard of uh, the essay, I think it was Mark Andreessen that wrote it. Uh, it's called A Thousand True Fans. Uh, he wrote it, I want to say like four or five years ago, but it's pretty much him saying like, find your passion, figure out a way now that the internet allows us to be, we can talk to the world, right? Figure out um, your passion, talk about it in such a way where you can garner your 1000 or 100 true fans that want to give you that $5 a month to get your perspective or support what you're doing monetarily. And then like, 
you're good. Five dollars a month, thousand people. That's five thousand dollars. Like that's how much I was making. At a, you know, more than I was making a month. Yeah, a month. yeah. Right? It replaces a livable corporate income. Hundred percent. And it's and I'm not over here to like try and say that you know I'm not discounting the, the, the at all the hard work. I know a lot of people are trying to put in right now to to grow those communities because I did the same thing and it was it was very hard. I remember getting those those first I'll, I'll never I find screenshots um I was making $89 one month uh and it, it, it was a it was a grind I wish I could pull it up it was like $89 oh, on Patreon I and I was streaming for hours and I was writing I was like my 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 dad was like Austin why are you spending so much time on the computer like are you making money and I'm like I made 90 bucks this month dad he's like 90 bucks this month what do you like dad I promise like I'm growing a community here I'm, I'm building something special and it just, you know, um, so I, I'm right there with you guys who are who are building that community right now and going through that. But yeah, so, it's a so, grind and it's a lot of feeling like you're talking to no one until yeah. one day people start to pay attention and they tune back in and then you finally feel like you have something going and then it's riding the momentum there. Well, a little hack too, if you're in that process right now, what I would do from about 8 p.m. to midnight every night when I was growing my Patreon was I didn't yet have a Instagram account that people could follow yet um, from my TikTok to, you know, I still had just my traditional Instagram and I had random people that I'd never heard of, you know, start following me. And so I would DM them. I'd say, Hey, are you from TikTok? And they'd be like, yeah, I am. Like, I love your TikTok. I just thought i follow you on Instagram. I was like, Oh, thanks. Well, I mean, if you want to keep up with me, I've got this Patreon over here. Like here's a recent post that I made that was free. Um, if you like it, you know, there's, there's a $4 tier where you can just, you know, it's kind of like buy me a beer uh, every month type thing. And, uh, yeah, that's I, that's how I think I got my first. I want to say 100 real patrons were from from DMs. Is I would spend countless hours DMing people and giving them my feedback and what was you know meaningful to me and, and everything. And and that is how I grew my initial like 100 fans. Um, and then from there, obviously, kind of economies of scale kicked in from TikTok. But if you're in that grind, don't don't you know uh, DMs are always opened normally. Uh, open rates on DMs are nearly 100% on, on Instagram, especially if you're coming from a perspective that's not like spammy and you're just very just authentic. So if you're grinding really. it. And it's human connection. People want mm-hmm. to feel heard and seen. So 100%. So Patreon, right? So so w- whenever I quit my job, I had Patreon. Mm-hmm. Um, I also had, uh, actually, I wonder if I can pull it up and just show you something. Yeah, I want to hear, I want to hear about all of your different income streams that you have in your business. Okay, let's see. And kind of the evolution of those. All right, sweet. I'm going to go back to my income statement from 2021. And I'm just going to start reading things off. Okay. So Make sure you don't violate any contracts. No, no. So in January uh, of 2021, right, I was still working my full-time job. P- for perspective, I quit my full-time job uh, very, very early March. So I'm pretty much like almost to the to the week here uh march of 2021 right so oh. when yeah yeah i'm full time now for a year so in uh in january i had made $17,914 and um this in 17,860 something of that was um, Patreon, right? So I had $46 paid to me from the creator fund. But all the money I made that month was from these awesome people supporting my work and and tuning into these live streams and and just getting jazzed about these essays I'd write about. I, I posted, um, I think I did the math, 218 uh, deep dive analyses into stocks, earnings, investor events, um, economic reports, like and I was posting at least once a day. I remember every um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I would do like a news recap. Every Thursday, I'd have a new stock pitch. Every Tuesday, I'd compare two companies that people would know that were very similar. Uh, think of like Home Depot versus Lowe's. And I'd kind of like compare the two and like really like kind of break down the int- intricacies. But I was posting every single day. And it was it was, it was was great. It was a grind, but I loved it. Um, yeah. And so like it's next just- month... Yeah, so 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 next month, uh, I think I had a sponsor, Status Money. I don't know if you guys know who they are. They paid me a couple grand. Um, I did another one in March with Status Money, and uh, oh, I started working with TradingView. So I took over TradingView's TikTok account. I, I I published fourteen videos, no, twelve, twelve videos to their TikTok account, talking about the different tools and and the different um, just value ads with their website ads to to people who are trading. And uh, that was, I think, $4,000 for those. Um, in 
April here, we had, oh, I started working with a really interesting um, ETF company called Defiance ETFs. What I did for them was more of like a consulting thing. They were very interested in learning more about how people on TikTok thought about um, investing into actual funds, right? And so uh, they paid me a couple of grand to sit down with them uh, for several hours every week and, and help them research and share feedback and, and kind of pull together like a marketing uh, scope for them to really attack uh, TikTok in a way that was more educational and brand awareness focused versus like converting to uh, not funded accounts, but have people actually like buy their ETFs. Um, in May, uh, who else here? I started working with public, public.com. They paid me a couple grand. Uh, oh, Grit Capital. I don't know if you guys know who they are, but they're like a, an, an email newsletter. Uh, they paid me a couple grand. Masterworks, uh, the company yeah. that allows you to invest into artwork in a fractional way. Really, really interesting company. Um, so I, I had worked with them a little bit. Um, I worked with TurboTax um, back in, in May as well. May was a really big month for me. So in the month of May was uh, $55,000, which is pretty wow. wild. It's yeah. crazy. It's literally like, almost your entire corporate salary in one month. Right, right. See, that kind of money, I think a lot of people don't realize is real yeah. in the online entrepreneur space. Like that is a real thing that happens to normal, everyday people. A, a normal guy who got a 2.8 yeah. in college, who's just really Crazy. passionate about nerdy things like finance and loves to just- You got to make that a tagline, the 2.8 GPA. Like you got to put that on there. <laughs> but it, I don't know. But, but put that in perspective, right? Um, I, I got the number here, 41,480 of that, right? $41,000 came from advertisers and advertisers are always looking for ways, new people that can, oh, they can yeah. tell their story, 100%. Um, mm -hmm. That's because advertising, traditional advertising, so this is a tier of what I work on in my job, mm -hmm. is incredibly expensive. And I think mm -hmm. that's why, obviously, I don't feel like this is news, but that's why influencer marketing is so powerful. It's because it's so much less expensive and you're getting in front of an audience that's already interested in the product. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And and so then June and July, very similar. Um, I'm trying to see if I worked with anyone really interesting and cool that I can call out. Hmm. Oh, at what point? Sorry, you go. I was going to say Intel. So what was kind of oh, yeah. cool um, yeah. and really, really nice is I made friends with some people that worked at TikTok. Um, I think his name's Ryan. Yeah, his name is Ryan. And he's a rock star. And he did like the, the, the creator marketing at TikTok. And he's like, dude, I follow you on TikTok. We've got TurboTax here, which is how I got the TurboTax deal. It's like TurboTax is looking for TikTok creators. You want to little do something with them? I was like, sure. And so same thing with Intel, which was also just as fun. Yeah, that's really cool. I, I am curious, at what point did you start to see like these 20, 30 K months start turning into bigger and bigger and snowballing for you. What was, was there like a switch that happened? Did you introduce new income streams? Like how did that kind of come to be? So I want to, yes, let me, before I hop into that, um, it, so I, I made, and I'm sure you guys can just Google Bloomberg, Austin Hank, which you'll see the, the, the headline that says I made more than I'll like like it. dollars like last year. Last year, on my taxes, I think it said like $700,000, right? Mm -hmm. I made $700,000 last year from my creator business. I paid myself 80,000. I paid my co-founder 80,000. And we, we probably spent maybe 30,000 traveling throughout the country to do different types of meetings and just big you know projects, including a podcast that's coming out pretty soon, um, which I guess we can talk about later. But over half a million dollars of that was reinvested into different startups that we believed in and that we wanted to bring more awareness around. So public.com, right? Very inclusive yeah. platform to allow anyone to begin investing toward their future. Um, they, they, they allow you to buy fractional shares. You can buy crypto and you can buy all these incredible things. You can have community discussions with the people. Like, I love that, right? Yeah. I was able to participate um, in one of their rounds. Um, another company is Herd. Herd is one of these social app platforms that allows people to kind of take, move, move away from like the comparison that comes with social media, but instead, remember like, you know, Visco, right? Yeah. So imagine Visco, um, but a little bit, a little less like, 
uh, just pictures, a little bit more community around it. You get to have little usernames, get to see what people are up to. Um, but you know, with Visco, you don't get likes, you don't get like crazy comments like you do on Instagram, the comparing people thing. Like it just, it's a lot, right? So we, we did a lot with them. And all I'm saying is like, yes, we made a lot of money in 2021, but we took a far vast majority of it and was able to invest it into a lot of startups that we believe in and that we're really excited about. Um, so yes, I, I made all this money, but I only paid myself 80 grand last year. I paid my co-founder 80 grand last year. Um, and hopefully this year is gonna be a little bit different and we're not going to be investing as aggressively, but to answer your question specifically, when did I see that switch? Um, actually, let me pull the numbers up. Let me see. Let me mute myself. Real quick. Excuse me. I had to cough. Um, so the big switch happened. It seems like it happened in, um, August, September, October, November, December. So February, so January is like 17, 18, February is around like 30, but then in August and September, we got to the 65 range. October was 133 and December was 110. Um, and I don't think, crazy. I don't yeah, no, <laughs> I don't look here, uh, crazy. what was the biggest thing? And to be honest with you, I think what happened was I was able to, that's what it was. Okay, here's what happened. So as a creator who was able to drive a lot of results for the companies that worked with me, public, um, uh, where's some of those here? Just Betterment. To make sure I'm not lying. Um, public, oh, um, Fundrise, um, what a couple others here, uh, Masterworks, um, yeah, just really cool companies, right? What I tried to do is I built these pillars around my advertising. So mm-hmm. I built more structure around advertising. I, I've, I realized, okay, as a 25 year old, what platforms am I using to build wealth? I'm using Betterment for my you know, long-term robo-advising. I'm using public.com for my single stock investing. I'm using Masterworks for my um, art investing, right? Alternative assets. I'm using Rally Road for, the, for a similar thing. I'm using uh, FTX or Coinbase or BlockFi. I'll actually have all three of them, but I'm using them for my cryptocurrency investing, Fundrise for real estate. So what I would do then is I built these sort of pillars around these kind of, you know, real estate, single stock, retirement. And then I said, okay, I have a little bit of leverage here. I have a good TikTok. I've got a lot of engagement. I've got a lot of cool people that's hanging out with me on Patreon. Let me now approach these companies in a very structured way that says, hey, here's what I want to do. Let's do a six month deal. Pay me um, so much a month. Like for example, what's a really good one here. Um, what I think I, yeah, I think Fundrise was around like 5,500 or, or six grand or something, right? Pay me, pay me this much to, to post once a month here. I also want a, a funded account bonus on top of that. I want to do ABC, XYZ. Um, and, and let's actually put real structure and meaning behind making money as a creator. And so I was fortunate enough for my co-founder to bring in a lot of his expertise around pricing and profitability. He did that for, um, PwC when he was a management consultant over in New York. And so he helped me structure these big deals. But then what happened was, okay, Austin, yeah, sure. Here's, you know, here's a deal for a, for a six or 12 month contract worth hundred grand. Here's another deal worth 60. Here's another deal worth 80. Here's another deal worth 110. And so that's when I was like, okay, we, uh, we did this. This was, uh, this was great. <laughs> it, came from, it came from you initially establishing, really you know, your ability yes. in these initial yeah. agreements that were lower tier and then reapproaching these different brands with, yeah. mm-hmm. this is what I want. This is what we did before. How can we make a mutually beneficial agreement here that obviously is going to be lucrative for you, but also translate for them, whether that be in the short term, sh- short term, or, you know, over a long term period before they actually start to see an ROI. hundred percent. And I think yeah. what a lot of creators don't think about is, you know, they, they look at, at, at what they're doing and they say, oh, cool. I just got this awesome one-off brand deal with this company or this one-off brand deal here. That's cool. How did you, did you email that person and check in on how their Saturday went this last weekend? Because they're going to go be your friend and you guys need to be friends because you guys need to figure out a six month contract, a 12 month contract. Like you guys, like just find the companies that you really, really love for me. That's public.com. I really love public.com. 
And I've had the awesome opportunities to meet some of their really cool man- people on their management team. And they have done a really good job taking care of me. Um, and, and it's like, it's just find those companies that really resonate with you as a creator, become really good friends with them, people who work there and just work something out that as you were saying, Michaela is beneficial, you know, beneficial for both parties and yeah. is, is lucrative for both parties. Because at the end of the day, these companies yeah. need authentic creators to tell their story and, um, chances are you're going to be one of them. So yeah. totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I think too, you know, going back to the one-off brand deal piece, and then we'll wrap this up is those generally, I feel like don't resonate in the same way as a longer term partnership where you've built the trust, um, and that you use, like, I think that's a big piece too, is it's hard to sell something you don't actually use. So if you have these pillars of all of these different tools that are already part of your plan. Yeah. Your story. Yeah. It just makes, it makes all the difference. Um, Okay. So we're coming up on an hour. I'll make this really quick. Okay. okay. Go to influentgen.com. There's a calculator that tells you how much you should be asking from these brands. Um, it, 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 it looks at your follower count on different platforms and it tells you how much money you should be asking. For example, I have a friend who has three and a half million followers on TikTok. He was asking for like a thousand dollars a video from a sponsored content perspective because he didn't know what to ask, right? <laughs> a lot of people don't know if they're asking too much, too little. Go use the calculator. It's pretty, pretty good. Again, that's influent, I-N-F-L-U-E-N-T, gen, G-E-N.com. Okay. I'm going to look at that. Um, Okay, cool. So we're going to finish off with an ending question and then I'll give you the space here to kind of go through all of the things that you are currently working on. But if you could only make one decision with your money for the rest of your life, what would it be? Oh, it's so vague. One decision with my money for the rest of my life. I'll let you interpret that however, however you see fit. I'm going to interpret it as a investing decision. Sure. Um, one decision with my money for the rest of my life. I, that will be, I will, I will take, oh, actually I'll do it like this. One decision with my money is I will not go back to the conformity and the glass ceiling kind of, of corporate America. Once you get that first hit of money that you make on the internet or with a side hustle, something I, I loved, and I had those early hits when I was in, in middle school with the snow blowing, like I, I loved it, right? The building a business. Once you feel that and you see that you can make money, you bring value to the world just the way you are right now, just how you come, you will quickly sprint away from your job and go all in on something you're super passionate about. That's the decision I'm going to make with my money for the rest of my life is go all in on myself and not have, um, just, just bet on myself that I think that's gonna be my, my answer. I love that answer. I really love that answer. Cool. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, okay. So you've got a lot of things that you're working on right now. Where can the people find you? So, um, you can find me at Austin Hankwitz on TikTok. You can find me, my, my personal Instagram at Austin Hankwitz or uh, wits.business, which it's kind of a dead account to be honest with you. But yeah, Austin Hankwitz on TikTok, that's the place to find me. If you care at all about super nerdy stuff like earnings analysis or um, you know what's happening with the economy or you know why Snowflake stock traded down 30% or whatever's happening with single stocks and all that fun stuff, Go to rateofreturn.substack.com um, or yeah, just, just look up Rate of Return Austin Hankwitz oh, on, uh, on the internet and it should pop up. It is my Substack, which is pretty much like a blog, email newsletter type thing. Um, no pressure. Go read it. A lot of it, like literally 95% of it's free. Um, so thumbs up there. And thank you so much, Michaela, for having me. This was a blast. And I hope yeah. I can come back. This was a lot of fun. Cool. Thank you for coming on. I'll make sure for everybody listening that all of Austin's information is linked in the show notes. So don't forget to take a look down there and go check him out. Follow him on TikTok, Instagram, although... I think you need to um, judge up your Instagram a little I bit. I know, I know, I'm slacking. I'm, I'm not very good <laughs> at the whole social media stuff. That's what's actually really funny is why, like, I just record on my cell phone with TikTok. It's like I don't know how to do all this stuff. I don't know how to edit these videos and make them cute. I just record my computer screen. Yeah, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be complicated. 
Um, cool. But thank you so much for coming on. This was fantastic. And I will catch all of you guys in the next episode. Make sure you let me know who you want to come onto the podcast. Don't forget to go leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps me and it pushes the podcast out. And we'll catch you next week. Thanks, guys. See ya.